uh, multiple, uh, multiple trial common garden test that's 40 years old. Um, basically, with Grand Fur, we don't do we don't do an awful lot of um, a lot of work with species like this. Uh, about 20 years ago, we would have been planting oh about half a million a year, and that's dwindled and dwindled and dwindled down to about 50,000 a year that we plant now. And um, at at that level of planting, all we're going to do is gene conservation and uh, oh uh, gene ecology and definitely not breeding anything like that. Uh, the only hope for it, I think, is just the way that forestry is uh, developing and risks are rising, especially due to different diseases. Uh, those are the, whoops. <laughs> those are the, the, the grand fur up there, the tight green um, uh, crowns. And this, of course, is Douglas fir. And that was probably a red cedar. And I'm saying this uh, not to deride uh, John's program, but um, basically the threat with Douglas fir is now Swiss needle cast, and the threat with red cedar is drought. Now, the properties of, well, the niche of, of Grand fir is drier zones, wetter sites. So it could be perfect to replace uh, red cedar. Some companies in Washington State already do that. Uh, Simpson does, and they have their own, they have an orchard for it and everything else. And then, well, Douglas fir, um, on the east side, it's going to be fine. We all, we all think so anyway. But on the west side, where you could put grand fir, it, it may not do so well. Anyway, so that's, a, a, I was going to say, brief introduction, even though it wasn't. Um, here's the. Uh, Here's the range. There's uh, a coastal part and an interior part. Now, because we are committed in our forestry program to conservation as well as uh, gene ecology with this species, um, we have taken some care to include the uh, interior population. Um, if you see uh, Tong Lee's stuff, uh, the species, uh, these, well, Grand Fur eventually moves north. Um, Anyway, we thought we had to do something to take care of the uh, interior uh, stands. Um, we've got uh, seed and sign collections from three, uh, three different stands in the interior. Uh, the seed is at the seed center uh, in our uh, Exitu Reserve uh, that Don, uh, Don uh, Dave Colatello uh, uh, is responsible for. Um, the other thing we did was, well, not we, but uh, Marie Vance did a study, a microsatellite study that I set up. I got the data for her, and she wrote it up. And basically, um, to look at the separation between the interior and the, and the coast, um, we got about six populations in the interior and in the coast. And then out of the, out of the data, Tuttle and Hope kind of pulled out as being intermediate between the two types of uh, grand fur. And oh, if you like microsatellite data, it just, that kind of shows that there is some crossover in the middle between the two. Anyway, um, so Cheng Yang, as I mentioned before, put these in in 1980. And, and the thing that Cheng Yang said to me that really struck home was, cumulative in insults. Like, if you leave something out on the land base for 10 years, you may not see everything that's going to happen. I put uh, western hemlock from the coast in the interior, and it looked great for 10 years, right? And he was a proponent, as, as is Greg O'Neill, of older trials, as, as, it, as you heard uh, um, earlier as well. <clears throat> anyway, um, here are the sites. There's four sites. And each site has 23 provenances. Of those provenances, about 20 are IUFRO. So you can find the same sources in Europe, uh, European trials. And also, um, Cheng added in some uh, BC lots from the seed, uh, seed center, just because he didn't have the, uh, a local for this. Um, and, there, and a local for this, he had to, he had to add those. 
Anyway, um, of these sites, this one's the wettest and the worst. Um, this one is, uh, has the best survival. Um, and originally, the survivals were like 90% at age 10, and we're down to 80% now. And there's about 1,100, well, 23, uh, 23 provenances, each represented by uh, three four by four plots. So 48 trees, so they're about 1,100. They're at three meters spacing, so almost exactly a hectare. Um, the Robertson is the absolute average Grand Fur site. This one out in the Nitmat, one thing that Cheng always did was he put in an oddball site somewhere. And sometimes you'd curse him because everything died. But this one is amazing. It's by far the most productive. Um, it has, at age 40, it has 40 meter trees in it, which even here on the coast is pretty amazing. Anyway, so that's kind of the setup. Um, oh, the other thing that came out of Cheng's, oh, might as well. Um, these are the provenances. Uh, basically, this lot up here is, is where the game is. These are too high into the Cascades. They're kind of like, they're kind of like the interior uh, populations. And these down here, these are in, in the zone of intergression with uh, white fur. And then um, the rest of it's pretty kosher. Where you would cut off, when I look at gain, where I make the cutoff is um, just here at the Columbia, this provenance does OK. And so I assume that um, you can say it's somewhat, mal uh, somewhat well adapted. Funny how maladapted and well adapted rhyme so well. Anyway, so this is Chang's paper that he published at age 10 on, along with Chang Yi Xing Shi, um, uh, at 10 years of age of, of, the, of the trial. Um, basically, um, he looked, was able to look at frost and he looked at needle disease because the crown's right there. Now the crown is 30 meters in the uh, high and you can't get anywhere close to it. Um, but anyway, I think the only thing remarkable um, about the early stuff was that uh, your Denopsis uh, needle blight was uh, particularly hard on the high elevation uh, trees. Um, the other things he found, analysis of variance, of course, site and provenance uh, are uh, very significant, uh, less or so block within site and uh, provenance by site, the uh, GVIE. And that trend continued. A lot of <laughs> trends continued uh, into the, into the uh, later, later stages. Um, this is what they would have looked like uh, when they uh, were dumped on me. That's about age 15. Um, oh, that's just the site again. But this is about age 20, uh, 25, 30. And this is what they look like today. Uh, that's a particularly big one, but on a poorer site. Um, so they're growing at this stage in, uh, about a meter a year. Um, uh, not all of them. <laughs> this little patch is those high elevation trees. Now, every provenance on every site had great trees. Like there were 30 meter trees of this particular provenance um, at different parts of that site. It's probably just a little bit on the wet side, although usually you get sword fern, they love it. Anyway, um, yeah, that's what they look like in the center of the trial. Um, yeah, we didn't thin, but uh, to some degree, things still have a chance. As I said, every provenance has some pretty darn good trees. Um, and right at this point, they're coming to rotation in about 40 years. and. In case you want to question that, I can prove that that's right. Um, this trial got, uh, did get logged already. And that's one of our remaining trees. And there's about 20 other trees that remain. And so what we're doing is uh, uh, we measured the height diameters and the stump heights in order to be able to uh, estimate the volume from the basal area. Uh, I haven't done that yet. This talk is a bit preliminary, <laughs> is preliminary but um, it, it's, it's quite doable, of course. Um, 
So, well, other sites, it's a lot happier story. I, uh, I did a quick regression of uh, latitude and height, and of course you know what you're gonna see. As time passes, age five, six, 10, 20, 30, well, uh, the R squared goes way up, and, and of course we didn't thin it, so you expect that. Maybe that doesn't mean an awful lot, but uh, I'm gonna look at ways of, of parsing out the genetic effect, hopefully. Anyway, also, uh, the problem there is, of course, that uh, latitudes uh, 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 compounded with elevation, and it has an effect as well. Of course, a strong one, so. Um, looked at uh, mean annual temperatures as well over time, and they did what you expect. Um, basically, your good trees are within uh, two degrees of the site normal, generally slanted to the warmer, of course, but what really won was local stuff. Now you may be, you may be familiar, familiar with the paper of uh, Ye and J. Wickerama with the Kim Cheng Douglas fir trials uh, that went in in the 60s and they rode up at age 45. This is pretty similar results. Um, uh, basically, the local sources did really, really well. Um, and to illustrate that, uh, um, Here's the best sources at age 40 at Salmon River, and the yellow is, is the fastest growing one, and you can see it is the local. And the other ones we've got, um, they're not that far off. Um, and here's, a, here's another 40 year um, at the Robertson, which, as I said, is pretty much your average site. Um, the provenances that did well uh, whoops, <laughs> uh, um, we're fairly local. Uh, American Material, uh, Washington State and that one, uh, and that one provenance over the Columbia um, also did really, really well. Like performance across, uh, provenances varied a lot, but also um, uh, there was uh, a strong provenance effect. So, uh, Let's see, to, to wind up, uh, basically what I was looking for, being a forester type, I was looking for gain, and if I looked across the well-adapted uh, sources, meaning starting at that one at, at uh, the Columbia, um, your best bet was the most northerly source, that one way at the top of the map, and it gave you about 9% gain over the, um, the rest of the field. And, um, a lot of the best material was BC material, although there's a couple, uh, Washington and that one Oregon source that are pretty good. So um, that's the gain. Uh, the, the climate bait seed transfer has cracked the error where um, Cheng put those three trials in the, in the drier side of, of Vancouver Island, but the one on the west side that's the most prolific, um, that is now uh, legal for seed transfer out in the VM1 anyone's familiar with our system. Um, so basically, gain and seed transfer in order. I was expecting to see a lot more flipping of ranks and, and, and was kind of disappointed that it turned out just like the Douglas fir. Um, I mean, there's plenty, of, there's plenty of good material in there from across the range, at least down to the Columbia. So if we ever did have to go ahead and use more of it, um, I think with this trial, we, we'd have a bit of a start. Anyway, that's it, thanks a lot. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, hi, thank you for your great presentation. It was super interesting. Um, I was wondering if you would also be willing to do tests of carbon allocation if for your well, 40 years of uh, common garden is a long time, so I think it would be interesting. Yep, yep. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. As I say, this is, this is uh, a preliminary kind of analysis. I want to get this written up and, and sort of wrap the species up uh, in, in, as regards my responsibilities for it. And I do intend to uh, look a lot more closely, particularly at other climate variables. I, that's just bare minimum stuff. And I thought 15 minutes, that should do it. Yeah. Thanks.
Any last questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Oh, thank you. Presentation. <laughs> thank you for being short and sweet. <laughs> okay. So our next speaker is Dennis Joyce, and he is presenting uh, testing climate-based seed transfer guidelines for jack pine in northeastern Ontario. So welcome, J Dennis. Good morning. I guess it's still morning. Um, I want to start by saying or acknowledging uh, Northeast uh, Seed Management Association is an industrial cooperative with a mandate for managing the operational seed bank for reforestation in Northeast Ontario. And so this work is oriented towards uh, taking Eastern uh, Canada models and applying them to uh, seed transfer guidelines uh, in a specific area of Ontario. Okay. Um, two uh, transfer trials were planted out in May of 2022. Uh, and what I wanted to share with you today was the analytical background that led to the selection of material and the location of the tests and actually a brief discussion of what the design of the test is. Each one of these topics could cover 15 minutes easily. So you might find this to be a bit of an overview. If uh, you're absolutely keen for detail, I'll probably be around for a little while to uh, share that with you. So with luck, we start with um, uh, calculating, estimating, modeling a, the climatic niche for uh, jack pine in Eastern uh, North America. Um, and it's uh, based on deriving uh, presence and absence data set. Uh, where, uh, that is then used in uh, random forest to um, generate classification trees, and I'll get to that in a minute. There's about 9,000 presence plots uh, derived from either inventory ground plots or ecological ground plots. Uh, and then there were 32,800 basically absence plots that were selected for their similarity to the presence plots. Uh, and then uh, 200 bootstrap samples were taken. Uh, basically, all of the presence plots were included each, in each sample, and an equal number of absence plots were randomly selected uh, for each one of those trials. Uh, and then each of the uh, bootstrap samples was using random forest was used to develop a classification tree. The terminal nodes of those classification trees provide an estimate or a prediction, if you want, of presence and absence. Okay, uh, so in theory, uh, the distribution of uh, positive uh, uh, predictions could be as many as 200 or as few as zero, right? So this is a uh, graph, if you want, of uh, the number of uh, positive votes out of 200 uh, expressed in 5% intervals. Uh, so... Uh, and the light bars are the presence plots, and the darker bars are the absence plots. Uh, arrow. I'm going to find it. Maybe I won't. There it is. Um, the um, presence plots uh, with the higher number of positive votes were essentially uh, fill, were the only. Uh, occurrence at the higher probabilities, there were no absence plots. And that uh, down to about 50%, the presence plots occupied at least 80% of those uh, overall plots that were in that classification. Uh, the, at 45, below 45% positive votes or uh, estimates, um, was only about 10% of the plots in that category uh, were, were um, actually presence plots. Okay, so there's another statistics that you could use, which would be occupancy. And so these lower uh, levels here would certainly be like incidental occurrence in that kind of a climatic condition. Okay. Uh, 
to be inclusive, uh, I chose to use the standard of 35% positive votes or more in order to uh, set what the climatic niche for the uh, Jack Pine would be. Uh, and at that level, there's 1% uh, error in emissions where uh, plots that have uh, Jack Pine are thought to be absent in the modeling. Uh, and 20% of the error is in errors of commission where you predict that it is there when it's actually not. Okay. So uh, when you map this out, the, uh, this is what the climatic niche, the spatial distribution of it looks like. It doesn't show up really well, but the uh, below 45 where the occurrence is incidental uh, is actually around the margins. You can see that in yellow. So um, it's a fairly robust model for um, what the current climatic conditions under which Jack Pine occurs. So when you uh, overlay that with uh, the projection of climate change for mid-century, um, you wind up with four, you can classify the land base into four different categories. Um, the lost habitat, which is 22% of what the current distribution is, uh, is um, the area that has less than 20% probability, well, and it's predicted to have 20% uh, positive votes or less, in which there's no current occurrence. So that's taken to be a high risk area where the current occurrence is likely to be uh, vulnerable to range recession. The uh, threatened category is then below 35% down to 20, still vulnerable, but l perhaps less so. Persistence would be the uh, olive green, and emergence would be the lighter green, uh, mostly on the north end. Now, uh, the emergent, uh, in terms of statistics, the emergence uh, habitat seems to counterbalance for uh, the lost habitat on the south, but uh, in large measure, um, the emergent habitat is either the Hudson Bay lowland, which is gonna be way too wet, or it's gonna be in northern Quebec area where soils are quite thin. So it's not really a one-for-one one replacement. So moving on to the ecological genetic model, in the early uh, 1990s, uh, I uh, set up a uh, ecological genetic study of jack pine in the Northeast. The, it has 97 seed sources in it, four replications of 10 tree row plots. And uh, there were a number of different uh, test environments in which it was put in order to uh, optimize the expression of phenology uh, or cold hardiness or growth potential. And uh, I used the farm field test uh, located in Sault Ste. Marie, which is a relatively mild environment for the uh, provenances under test, uh, and uh, took five-year data, um, subjected it to stepwise regression analysis in the model that, sorry, And the model that resulted was um, a function of D100 primarily, and D100 is the Julian calendar date uh, for at which uh, growing degree days reach 100. So it's a measure of early and or warm springs. Uh, and then there was um, a second variable. It was mean annual temperature. Um, the Negative weighting on, on uh, the first variable um, suggests that uh, longer growing seasons, which start earlier, uh, convey greater growth potential. Uh, the uh, negative weighting on mean annual temperature is saying that for the, especially the warmest conditions, the degree, the uh, D100 overestimates how much it grows. Um, there's a lot I could talk to about what I think all that means, but uh, time constraints won't allow for that. Now, the R square was 0.411. And you can see, uh, I should say the background is uh, using a, uh, the confidence interval around the mean population performance, uh, I portrayed what seed zones would look like. And you can see that basically there are uh, three, well, there's a total of five seed, zone, seed zones that are included within the geography 
but only three of them really uh, service 97% of the land base. So um, the next step was to extrapolate that regional model to a Eastern North America wide model, which would be perhaps questionable, only I've found with earlier work in uh, Eastern white pine and black spruce that these regional models that I've generated are highly predictive of overall performance when I've looked at um, disparate provenance tests from different regions. In the case of eastern white pine, the model was actually the best model no matter where I went. Okay? Um, so in order to have some confidence that this, this uh, eastern North America wide model has some veracity, it's always nice to look at uh, an independent data set and see how this model would perform. Unfortunately, in jack pine, there's very little information on uh, seed transfer and all that. The earlier work generally only states um, the variation is associated with uh, growing degree days and latitude, uh, but most of them don't go any farther than that, so it's really not too helpful. So in the absence of that, I said, why don't we use this as a hypothesis? So the one test that's uh, really a very nice test is uh, reported by Jefferson Jensen's in uh, 1980, and it's 20 year height growth performance and survival uh, of uh, jack pine. It has 26 provenance in it, and those are represented by the white stars. There are 14 test sites and uh, six with the lowest uh, degree date, I'm sorry, the D100 were retained for this examination of veracity. And those are the green dots. So one there, one there, one there, one there. And one in the upper lower peninsula of Michigan. And this test, uh, in the tests on each of these sites included four replications of 64 tree plots. So this test itself, like it's not strong with regards to the number of provenances, and it's not strong in terms of statistical strength because of the size of the plots versus the number of plots. Okay, so um, using the uh, model that I generated, uh, it, this is the postulated um, pattern, if you want, of uh, seed zones. And so I selected the uh, six uh, test sites that were within the warmest zone as the most likely to be uh, allowing for the expression of growth potential. The lake state's uh, mean height, I used the, the mean of the height of the six test sites that were expressed in the literature as percent of plantation mean. And I just substituted the 20 year uh, information for the model that was generated in Northeast Ontario. The R square was 0.61. The model for Northeast Ontario was 0.41. So it's actually fairly remarkable that the study in Northeast Ontario does a better prediction of performance in the Lake States uh, than it does in the, its own geography. <clears throat> so with that as background, that certainly increases the confidence that the extension of these um, seed zones to an Eastern North America basis uh, is pretty uh, valid. So I could then take these seed zones and, uh, sorry, and uh, just model the transfer of these seed zones based on mid-century uh, climate uh, gradients. And the seed zones shift in this pattern. And so you can view this for Eastern North America if you want as the uh, deployment zones for mid-century. And um, then the baseline model that uh, I just explained to you could then be the procurement zones. Okay. So uh, in terms of deployment for Northeast Ontario, there's basically two and a half zones. Uh, the southernmost zone from uh, the Lake States is of uh, keen interest. And um, certainly the orange zone that's dominated by Northwest Ontario um, is um, also a, a strong candidate for the northern end of uh, 
the managed forest in eastern Ontario. So I went to uh, Michigan State and they uh, graciously uh, provided me with nine open pollinated uh, seed lots from their second generation program. Uh, I went to Northwest Ontario and got uh, two first generation uh, open pollinated seed sources and a uh, collection from a second generation clonal orchard. And then uh, I also included uh, a second generation and some third generation material from uh, eastern, North, uh, eastern Ontario and um, used those to establish the test. The, uh, this map represents basically today. The climatic conditions for the decade centered on 2030 look like this. And you can see the uh, red zone is already entering into the um, uh, geography of interest. The orange zone dominates at the moment and, and yellow is still of some importance and the yellow is being local. But if you, oops, back. But if you uh, look at the procurement zone versus the um, deployment zone, what you can see is that when we procured material from uh, Northwest Ontario, that in theory represents a lateral move. It's just the orange zone to the orange zone. And that if you, uh, the movement of Michigan stuff to uh, Ontario, to the location represents a moderative uh, progressive treatment uh, or uh, assertive advanced and the, the local source is sort of uh, what is it you do if you don't um, if you don't do anything. So the two trials that went out, uh, I stole the uh, for inspiration the interlocking uh, replication design that Libby and Cockerham uh, described in twenty or in 1980. The purpose of that design was to help mitigate the effects of crown closure on uh, measuring genetic effects. Uh, I modified it to replace replications with, um, with the different uh, regional sources so that uh, Northwest Ontario sources became Rep1 and so forth. The um, merits of this include that uh, mortality is unknown. Plot, the optimum plot size will be generated, will be dependent on mortality. And the mortality is likely to be different between those regional sources. And by uh, separating these uh, sources out, uh, we can actually have different plot sizes for the different regions depending upon how things perform. And operationally, it promotes hybridization between sources, but it also would support collections from these regional materials, special collections in case the northern element wanted to use just the, the local source, et cetera, depending upon how these things perform. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dennis. Are there any questions? Greg. Hello. 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 Dennis, thank you for a great presentation. Um, just a quick question. Do you think that um, your, your gene ecology model did not have a squared term to kind of bring the tail down on the, yep. on the positive side? And also, your, I, if I understood correctly, your gene ecology model was built using the southernmost site or one of the southern sites, and most of your populations were colder. Do you think that uh, lack of having sites, uh, or pardon, ha populations from uh, warmer uh, locations uh, might also have uh, contributed to, um, or if you'd had populations from warmer sites, you might have had a stronger model? Um, that's a good question. Um, the, um, the paradigm for this work is that different environments uh, promote or restrict the expression of inherent capabilities. So the uh, mild test site in Sault Ste. Marie was expressly put there to allow for the expression of growth potential. There was another test site uh, in further north that went in to evaluate cold hardiness. Uh, those two traits were correlated uh, at 0.5. Uh, 
So damage increased as growth potential increased. So there's a larger body of information than that, but for this work, it was just an expression of growth potential. I think time for one quick question. <laughs> So in your uh, species climatic niche model that you, uh, that you developed, you said your final threshold gave you a 20% commitance error. And I was wondering if you had noticed uh, if there were any physiographic patterns in that, if it's capturing you know, some of those areas you were talking about where uh, ecologically it may be unsuitable for non-climatic reasons. I think you should ask the moderator for 10 bucks. That's a good question. <laughs> Whether you get it or not is really not my problem. Um, I didn't, you know, time's short, so I, I didn't really cover that. But um, without actually going through the detail of uh, sorting out what was what, um, undoubtedly, the thing is about jack pine is it, it really grows on dry sites. It occurs in the Hudson Bay lowlands. But they, it only occurs in the Hudson Bay Lowlands if there's these isolated sandy ridges, and there's not many of them. But if it's climatically suitable, the model projected that it, and if I could probably go back, I could show you that the uh, climate niche model includes a, a fair chunk of the Hudson Bay Lowlands, which, while in, climatically it's suitable, edaphically it's not. So I suspect a, a fair amount of that 20% error was associated with Hudson Bay Lowlands. Make that 12 bucks. Thank you so much, Dennis. That's uh, all the time we have for that. So, our, uh, uh, so next up, we have Beth Rosaliski, uh, Roskilly, sorry. Um, and she'll be presenting phenotypic and genomic signals of climate adaptation in Western Larch, informing assisted migration and climate-based breeding. So thanks, and go ahead, Beth. Okay, let's see if the confidence monitor lives up to its name. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate in uh, Sally Aiken's lab at the University of British Columbia. And this work in the University of British Columbia is on the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Today I'm presenting a broad overview of my PhD research. Uh, which has been exploring the phenotypic and genomic signals of local adaptation to climate in Western Larch in hopes of helping to inform assisted migration and climate-based breeding strategies. Uh, and this, project, this work has been a part of the larger collaborative co tree project looking at multiple uh, native conifer species. So of course, a challenge we face with changing climates is we have to adjust our management strategies. And um, I think there's been a lot of good uh, talks and discussions already about assisted migration. This is one of the promising potential solutions uh, under changing climate regimes. But there's different, and there's different um, flavors of that. There's assisted gene flow among populations within the range. And there's breeding uh, based on future climates. And there's also assisted migration beyond the range, sometimes called assisted uh, range expansion. So those are, these are three different options we can uh, use and Greg talked yesterday about climate-based seed transfer in BC and I think that's a, such a great example of um, encompassing all of these approaches actually. So Western Larch is a trial species that's undergoing assisted migration beyond the range in BC thanks to forward-thinking folks here and in part that's because the change in suitable habitat that's projected into the future uh, with changing climates uh, is that it's going to expand quite greatly in BC. So in the blue, oh, sorry, I used my laser here. Uh, in the blue shows the expansion of areas of suitable habitat for Western Larch in BC by 2050. And in the red is actually where the current range is, is the southeast corner of BC. And in the red, you see contractions of that suitable uh, habitat. And on the right, you can see that BC seed planting zones for 2030 reflect this expansion in er of areas of suitable habitat. 
So my research is looking at some found foundational questions uh, for what we need to know for the success of assisted migration and climate-based breeding strategies in this species. So looking at the strength of local adaptation to climate, which environmental drivers are the strongest uh, uh, drivers of population differentiation, and then also looking at how selective breeding for faster growth can affect climate adaptive traits in this species. So the research approach combines three different types of data. We're looking at phenotypic data uh, with a common garden experiment I established, uh, environmental data, both geographic predictors and environmental predict uh, climate predictors from climate NA, and uh, ge genomic data. And then we use these three pieces of data to look at two lines of evidence for local adaptation using phenotype environment associations and genotype environment associations. So uh, the sampling for this project was mostly range-wide. Uh, Western Larch has a smaller range. And the phenotypic data was collected from a common garden experiment I established outside of the current range here in Vancouver at UBC. Um, and it included 52 natural populations uh, shown in the blue and purple and 28 breed selectively bred families um, provided by Trevor, uh, who is in the room, uh, and uh, selected and provided by Trevor uh, that I planted with those natural populations. And Trevor is the geneticist for the Western Larch Breeding Program in BC. Uh, the genomic data was collected from a provenance trial in southeast BC here in the yellow triangle. Um, and that was established by Barry Jaquish, if he's in the room. Oh, I, hope he, I was hoping he was. Um, and we sampled 44 natural populations in the red and purple. And so just to point out, the common garden is well outside the climatic niche of the, uh, of the species. And, and the idea there was to test, uh, simulate uh, warming with climate change as well as uh, assisted migration beyond the range. So Western Larch's range, you just saw that in the other map, is relatively small and it spans limited environmental gradients. And we know from previous field provenance trials that there's high genetic variation within populations and we uh, estimated quite low population structure even for uh, this conifer, even for a conifer species. So the FST was between 0 and 0 0.01. Um, and just for comparison, interior Douglas fir, which range overlaps with Western larch, its FST is a bit higher. So for the first approach, we look at phenotype environment associations with the common garden data. And for this, uh, we measured several different traits. We measured height growth throughout the season. We measured bud break, bud set, um, and drought resistance, and I'll talk about those drought experiments uh, shortly. And then cold injury in the fall as a measure of cold hardiness. And just to point out um, what we can do with these smaller uh, single site trials and seedlings, this is the number of measurements and observations we took just within one season, uh, which is the data I'm presenting today. So over 98,000 uh, measurements total. As someone with a background in ecophysiology, I'm still pretty impressed with the sample sizes we get for genetic data. So um, the traits were chosen uh, because they're associated with the seasonal abiotic risks of climate change and assisted migration. So for example, bud break, oops, bud break uh, is an, can be, the timing of bud break can be an adaptation to the risk of late spring frost. Uh, similarly for the timing of bud set with early fall frost risk, and then we are concerned also about cold hardening in the fall, especially as we, with assisted migration, we move species uh, to colder climates initially. And then drought resistance is becoming an increasing concern, and Marzana gave a nice introduction uh, about that. So when we look at the, at the, with the traits we measured, we found high variation within most of the traits and low variation among populations. So this Figure just illustrates, gives you a visual of that with annual height growth and provenance on the X. And each, um, in the green, you can see the within population variation and the black is the among population variation. 
We use this metric, VPOP, the proportion of phenotypic variation among populations, to get an estimate for this. And we can compare that to FST that I mentioned earlier, um, which is the neutral genetic variation among populations. When VPOP is greater than FST, it indicates a signal of local adaptation in the trait. So among the traits we measured, uh, height growth, final bud set and bud break had similar levels of VPOP, um, while drought resistance and cold injury had the lowest um, population differentiation values. And this signals that there's relatively weak local adaptation in Western Larch and fairly high adaptive potential in most populations. As for the environmental predictors, we found that the geographic predictors, at least based on single uh, variable tests, were the strongest. And this is illustrated for longitude here, where bud break and annual high growth were both associated with longitude, such that bud break was later in the eastern populations, and annual height growth was higher in the eastern populations. Bud set, on the other hand, was associated most strongly with elevation, um, and with bud set being earlier, the higher the elevation, uh, which is consistent with avoiding early fall frost risk at higher elevations. So just to reiterate, out of the climate variables we tested, and we tested annual climate variables, so there may be more to dig into with seasonal variables, but longitude and elevation come out as the strongest predictors of the phenotypic variation. As for cold hardiness, we actually found the weakest signal. Um, VPOP was quite low, no different than FST, and it was associated with cold temperatures, but the difference between the most extreme populations was quite small. Um, and we tested, these, uh, we tested these using branch tissue samples that we subject to low temperatures. And we, subjected, we had to subject them to quite low temperatures, negative 25 and negative 30 degrees Celsius um, in mid-October, uh, just to get to this 50, around this 50% mark. And so we think that this suggests that there's strong global adaptation to cold temperatures in this species. And this is consistent with its uh, boreal evolutionary history of the Larix genus. For the drought experiment, we decided to do this in 2021, which turned out to be a great year to do a drought experiment at the record-breaking heat domes. And so we put, the drought, we put drought covers up over the beds in mid-May, and drought, uh, the drought treatments were not watered for five months until mid-October. So no water for the drought treatments, and then the controls were regularly watered within the covers. And in this photograph here on the bottom, you can see the controls uh, looking healthy, and then this is sort of mid-season, and the drought uh, treatment differences. We measure drought resistance um, as chlorophyll fluorescence declines over time. And this image just shows you uh, an experimental map of the drought treatments. In green are healthy chlorophyll fluorescence values and then decreasing to orange values, which are, which are dead trees. Um, and if you have more questions about how we did this, uh, please ask after the talk. Um, but despite five months without water, we only achieved 13% mortality in these three-year-old seedlings. So they're, they're quite resilient. Uh, despite the low mortality that we achieved, the drought treatments did reduce annual height growth and induce much earlier bud set, so we did see strong effects from the drought treatment. And when we looked at the signals of local adaptation in terms of drought resistance, we found very low population differentiation and no strong environmental association. So it looks like there's pretty weak local adaptation to drought, but again, because of that high survival in such a stressful year in seedlings, we think that this suggests strong global adaptation to drought in this species. We also looked at the relationship between drought resistance and annual height growth, uh, and found that, and this, the idea here is to look at for a trade-off between growth and drought resistance, but we found that there's, the less drought stress was weakly associated with greater annual height growth, uh, suggesting that there's no trade-off between drought resistance and height growth, at least in the seedlings. 
Um, if you didn't get a chance to, we carried on this uh, experiment, this drought experiment, into another season and then rewatered the drought treatments to look at drought recovery. Um, Martin Henry did his undergraduate thesis looking at the drought recovery in these populations. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to uh, look at his poster and you have any questions about that, please grab Martin or me. Uh, so for the second research approach, we looked at genotype environment associations. And to do this, we sampled 44 populations from the provenance trial and a few from the common garden experiment with leftover probes. And what we did here is we pooled uh, populations and looked at the allele frequencies uh, per SNP or loci. And so we can look at the allele frequencies per population and it, relate them to their source climates to look for uh, associations. And this was done using a Bayesian univariate approach, which it means per loci, per predictor variable, per environmental variable. What we found when we looked um, at these associations is that the top environmental variable by far came out to be longitude. And then the second was continentality, and these were consistent with the drivers we found in the phenotypic data, but uh, cold temperatures was the third uh, most associated, and elevation was the least out of the, these variables that we tested. So a little bit uh, different signal that we're seeing from the genomic data, and uh, a signal that cold temperatures uh, may have a little more to say there. Um, and just to emphasize, we tested 1.48 million SNPs. And so this is a low number of loci associated with these variables, which corroborates that weak signal of local adaptation. Uh, so the final question, we, we wanted to look at how selective breeding for fast growth affects climate adaptive traits using the common garden experiments. And so we had the selectively bred families provided by Trevor and natural populations. And these were sampled from the two current seed planting zones. Uh, so I'll be showing you data from a western zone and the eastern zone and the comparisons between the breeding families and the natural populations. And so here's those comparisons for annual height growth and final bud set. In the purple are the selectively bred families. And uh, Sure enough, their faster growth is achieved in both zones compared to the natural populations, and this is in part due to a bit of a delay in bud set in the selectively bred families. As for the climate adaptive or climate stress response traits, we didn't see any strong effects of selective breeding uh, for cold injury or drought resistance for both zones other than a slight signal of elevated cold injury in the eastern zone for the selectively bred material. Um, but no, this difference is, very, is quite small, and uh, we had limited sample size for this as well. So taking that uh, with a grain of salt. So as for the implications for the management of western larch in the future, um, this species really highlights that not all species will benefit equally from assisted gene flow among populations, and that, uh, that western larch is one of those species, given its weak signals of local adaptation, where moving material between populations may provide limited benefits. It also illustrates that seed transfer guidelines um, can be less conservative among seed sources compared to species with stronger local adaptation. And, uh, our results suggest it can be similar between natural and selectively bred seed. Uh, and that's because selective breeding so far has not compromised cold hardiness or drought tolerance, found no evidence of trade-offs there. Uh, but it'll be important to continue to uh, consider seasonal frost risks, and it seems to indicate that these will be important to consider, especially for elevation and longitudinal transfers. Uh, with that, I just want to thank everyone who made this work possible, uh, especially my advisor, Sally Aiken, and the Aiken Lab, and everyone who worked out with me in the lab and the field, and um, the people who provided seed, as well as the funding and sponsors for this project. Um, that's all I have. Thanks for your attention.
Thank you very much, Beth. We have time for a couple questions. I'm looking forward to some questions. Hi, thank you, Beth, for your presentation. My question is that you found like a low local adaptation. Um, I, I was wondering if it because of the variation of the individuals and that caused the less variation among populations, would that be possible? The, uh, so the variation within populations among individuals leading to, in some cases for some traits, there's quite high variation within populations that could dampen that, that signal a bit. But I also think that you know, the evidence from these different lines of evidence suggest there's quite weak local adaptation generally in this species. Um, and that may be more due to uh, the geographic or the climatic range that it spans as well as, um, you know, western larch tends to be uh, at lower stand densities than some other species, and it could uh, increase long distance gene flow functionally. Um, so there may be something more about the biology of this species that's leading to the uh, weak local adaptation as, as well as the environmental gradients it spans. Yeah, sure. Hi, thanks so much, Beth, for the incredible work. Um, I have a question about the drought experiment. Yeah. Uh, it's not my expertise at all, but we've been talking a lot about it at the Morton Arboretum, and among both our scientists and like our local forest managers, there's been kind of anecdotal observations that drought can have years before it has like a major impact on mortality. So yeah. a drought event might not cause mortality till five years later. So what do you think or know about that? And is there a chance to watch this kind of experiment into the future for another several years? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously doing this just in seedlings over one season gives us only a snapshot of uh, information. And the, uh, the combining that with the sort, I think the tree ring data provides us a lot of helpful information looking at um, responses to drought over time. And I think there's both, drought's complex, right? There's severe droughts and then there's drought, there's cumulative stress of drought over time or the thousand cuts idea with drought stress and then um, disease uh, issues on top of the drought stress. So. Um, I don't know if I'm really getting at your question. I'm kind of rambling, but drought is complex, and I think there's a lot of paths we need to take to find answers to uh, looking for ways we can use, if there's genetic adaptations to, to drought, finding them and utilizing them. I think that's time, or all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much, Beth. All right, so our Our next speaker is Diogracias Royunzoiga, and his presentation is The Penalty of the Height Growth Syndrome in Tree Breeding and Forest Management. So thanks and welcome to Diogracias. Okay, sure. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you for staying around, sticking around to follow my presentation. The, my title is a little bit provocative, okay? So it's essentially they intended to attract you to stay around and follow my presentation. And I'll also convince the organizing committee to accept my abstract. So just take it as it is, but you'll get a point as we go. So I um, acknowledge my colleague, Andy is here, and some other folks who didn't attend Robert and Robert. And they were from Alberta, obviously. Now, I'm just going to talk about a, a simple, it, my, my presentation is very simple. It doesn't have any magic new method around. I'm just trying to, to communicate a simple message of a practical nature when we make a decision on plant breeding. And I know this presentation has been put in the same group as the climate change adaptation. It's not climate change adaptation. I think it's a, a scheduling convenience. This is just the tree breeding. So my talk will be about uh, our emphasis in selecting for height growth when uh, there are some other traits that we can consider. There are some practical reasons for that. And there are also some kind of uh, familiarity and obs obsession of some kind. So what is an issue? 
we are in northern Alberta. I mean, northern Canada. So Canada is a, if you, you're new, you just came in for the conference. It's just a very northern environment. It's cold, and everything goes slowly. But as a breeder, you are essentially a forestry, a forest company is working through a rotation age of 80 to 100 years, depending on where you are. And about 95% of reforestation and forest activities in Canada, especially in the West, except maybe in New Brunswick and others, is on, on public land. So essentially you are practicing forestry or decision on public land where there are multiple objectives. And because of that, there are rules that you have to follow. So if you are a breeder, you have to work within that mosaic of complication, observing certain cautionary rules, while also intending to make progress, okay? And then, so the, here is what an eight years old trial look like in Northern Alberta at 56 degree north and 500 meters elevation. It's very, for some of you, like in the Carolinas and maybe in Africa, this is probably a one year and a half tree. And here is what the 35 years old trial will look like a couple of degrees south, but at higher elevation, okay? So we have, Things grow slowly in the first 15 to 20 years, probably what you can credibly measure is height, okay? And uh, w so what about height? So height, the foresters, especially those in growth and yearly forest men menstruation and biometrics, they like using height age relationships to forecast the <coughs> stand yield in the future. If you are working in the Crown land, those who are not familiar with the crown land, those are monarchy terminologies that we use in Canada, is a public land, okay? If I kind of switch between those, it's just because I'm familiar with those ones, you don't be confused, it's private, I mean public land. If you are working in that area, okay, the forest companies which are private sector have to do some investment in tree breeding or research or whatever on the private land, on crown land, public land. So what is the benefit that they're getting? Well, the benefits that they, they are getting is just basically getting an uplift in the amount of timber they can harvest from the existing stand in a promise that what they will plant now will be able to produce more wood in the future and compensate what actually they have taken now. So that is called the allowable cut effect, which they use to uplift their current annual allowable cut, AAC. But that in doing that then, it comes with a lot of policy that prove that what you are doing now actually is a sound science. Can we trust that you will be actually being able to produce that wood if we accept you to, to take it now, okay? So then, this bring some motivation, okay, the motivation for private sector to want the results now, which they can demonstrate and they include it in the forest management plan to access timber, okay? And uh, there are some policies in Alberta and British Columbia where there is a requirement for forest companies to use the age, age correlation as a, I think I, I was reading some report where Alvin Yancha called that age, age correlation as a, some form of a penalty index. Essentially, you are just penalizing the current decisions on genetic gain for something that may occur in the future that you may not be able to verify now. So, and then even if you didn't have a mandate, a mandated requirement to use age age correlation, as a breeder, you still have a need for using this age age correlation at least to find your optimal selection age. Okay, now. That age age correction is not always available, okay? It is always available only for height because you can serially measure height, but you can't serially measure diameter and volume, okay? So then, and yesterday if you went to PRT, you will find that a forester, I think it was Scott, who was in there, it looked like the forest companies have more than just wanting to increase yield, they also have 
the need to use the improved city, which you call, you call class A in British Columbia, to actually overcome the challenges of standard establishments. They have to outcompete the weed, and they also have to meet their, their performance requirement assessment in the, on public land. So in that regard, you have an inevit inevitable use of height as your primary decision criteria for selection, which I called the reason for syndrome. Now, Bruce Zobo and uh, Kereshon wrote a, a two-page paper, if you are old enough to hang around and have read this old material, they called it a syndrome of height growth. So the, what they are trying, they were trying to caution against the obsession of selecting trees based on growth, considering that there are some other traits that are important, like survival, insect and disease tolerance, or resistance, and even wood properties. Okay, so you can't get your yield from a fast growing tree if it is unable to survive in that environment, and you can't produce enough tim good timber if it's actually degraded wood properties. That's what they are trying to say. So my question, here now, is not just plagiarizing their title, but they just say probably too we have high growth syndrome in, in the northern environment, okay? So what I'm going to do here, I'm just looking at uh, one provenance tri progen trial in northern Alberta, and uh, I just to see if I selected the trees based on height, which we normally do, and uh, Without knowing anything about the, you see, diameter at breast height, which is also used in, in calculating volume, and without having a chance to see the volume itself before selection, what could that be potentially losing in terms of genetic gain? And what could a breeder be doing in terms of losing, rogging out some of the, the, the good material that I actually wanted? So the data is the project trial, which is the 25 years, 24 years old, 125 uh, families on three sites. And the volume here was derived using height and DDH using the Alberta ecological based individual tree volume equations. So what is the relationship between height, breeding value, and the diameter at breast height breeding value? It's a good correlation, okay? This is R square, this is a correlation in F387. It's a high correlation, but it's probably not perfect. So now, our breeding regions span the, a number of natural subregions, okay? Natural subregions, I don't know if everybody is familiar with that, but think of it as having a breeding region with a different kind of climatic zone or ecological zone embedded within it, and the breeding region essentially engulf all those. So I was trying to see here, because the volume itself that they use is based on the equation that are linked to those natural subregions, what is the relationship between height and diameter with volume in those natural subregions, okay? And as you can see here, in the lower, in the, in the boreal, this is a, sorry, how do I go back? Okay, forward. Okay, so this is the, is the correlation between height and the volume breeding region, diameter and volume breeding values when you consider everything lumped together, okay? Now when you look at individual natural subregions that are contained in there, this boreal island uh, mountainous system that are embedded in the boreal forest. Okay, so you have high elevation similar to the, low, the lower foothill of the Rocky Mountains, but in the northern part of the province, we call them boreal iron. And you see the correlation is still high, sorry. The correlation is high for diameter with volume and a little bit lower for height with the volume. 
If you go into the central mixed wood, the, the, the dry mixed wood, that would essentially be an area which is relatively dry, okay, but the elevation is low. So you have a correlation going down, okay, for height with volume, but it's still high for height, for diameter with volume. And if you go into the central mixed wood, which make up a large part of our beta, and you have, the correlation is, is higher than that, than it was for the dry mix wood, and it's even higher for diameter with volume. And here is the summary of those scatter plots, what you get in the scatter plot. And then you can see consistently that you have higher correlation for diameter and a little bit less for, for height, and the correlation is, is not perfect. It differs between natural subregions. So, what are you getting? For example, if I take these 125 trees and then it selects them either based on diameter, height, or based on DBH, or based on volume itself, okay? So, the way to understand this table is this. If I select for height, the, the, the best 25 of the 125 families, my genetic gain for height is 15 points, almost eight here, okay? But those same selection, they will give me th only 13.5% uh, height, uh, diameter gain, and uh, they will give me, sorry, All right, that's kind of going too far back. Okay. And they will give me, and if I take, if I were to convert height diameter gain, height, height gain into volume gain, I will have to multiply it by almost Two, okay? So volume gain is twice height gain, okay? And if I selected for the height, for diameter, I will get genetic gain for diameter, okay? But that one is 13% for height and 33% for volume. And the conversion factor from diameter selection gain to volume gain is 2.15, okay? So I just do the same. You can kind of take, yeah, sure, you can take a look at this. I just do the same for, if I selected the best 50, okay? You can see that one. If I select the best 75, you can see the same thing, okay? And then, so what do I get out of this? What I get out of this is that, of course, diameter is more correlated to volume than height is, okay? So if you aggressively, for the same, because of the pressure that you are facing, if you aggressively rob your cereal orchard early, when it is young, you're essentially going to lose something, okay? And the loss you are going to incur is somewhere between four, in terms of volume, is somewhere between four and 5%, okay? You're going to lose that. And uh, this loss could even be higher, because here I just looked at height, and diameter, okay? I didn't consider other things like survival, which will determine the area-based genetic gain. I didn't consider about the insect and diseases, which would also account for productivity, okay? And what I heard from here, from Andreas, from others who have talked about climate change adaptation, they were saying, the fact that it is growing fast, it doesn't mean that it is happy, okay? There is something that is being lost. So that is essential the message that I'm trying to get. Now that it convert height to volume, probably a 2% that we use in our beta, and I think BC used that one, is essentially supported at least from this trial that I get, okay? And uh, these are just limitations that you can just lead yourself. That this is one trial that I've looked at. There must be some other things. I've looked at it growth trait. I didn't look at any other traits that contributed to productivity that he may also increase the loss, okay? Thanks.
Thanks very much, Steve Groshans. We have uh, time for a couple questions. Thanks, Dio. That was really interesting. Um, interesting to see that sort of two times height for volume. If we were to switch over to volume and, and for our selection, what age do you think that that could occur at? Would it shift when we could make those selections? So the, okay, thanks, Bab. So for, in our all the spruce and pine trials, in the past, those especially which were established during Nalinda's time, we used to start measuring diameter at the age 18, okay? That's where we used to start. There, that was kind of a minimum way. And I think it, because we have a, a longer province where the northern is very cold, where trees grow very slowly. So I would say maybe around age 20 there, you still have to start to having kind of diameter, uh, diameter, good diameter data, okay? Somewhere and above, there you can think of volume. Otherwise, before that, you don't have credible DBH data, and therefore you can't derive volume, okay? The good thing in Alberta, people have talked about the commissioning trials. In Alberta, we don't decommission trials, okay? Once you have established this, even if it's yours as a private sector, you can't cut it, okay? It will be there, we have laws that prohibit it discontinuing trials once you have established. So we can, in the end, verify these things as we go. Hello. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very great presentation. And as far as I know, the, the diameter is less sensitive to, uh, sorry, more sensitive to the commutation, to the density, those things. So uh, from this presentation, it seems as is as important as the height, but in the end, when we plant those trees in the in the in the field, the density is something harder to be controlled. In that case, do you think uh, think the diameter is still as important as the the height? Well, yes, diameter is important as height. There is a point that I didn't mention in in there, that is the correlation, the high correlation between the volume and the diameter compared to that of height could also be by the, could, could be real ecologically and genetically, but could also be some by design. It may there may be some element, okay? The volume that I showed here is not a directly measured volume, it is calculated from these two variables, okay? And uh, the way the biometrics of growth and yield in forestry works, diameter goes in there as a squared variable. Okay, so going there as a squared variable compared to height, then it may give it a much greater role in deriving volume and the correlation that you are seeing here than it probably is actually is. So there is those type of kind of possibility. And I also, I'm not a civil culturalist to understand the, the role of density and how it relates to height growth vis a vis diameter. Go. Thank you. Uh, it for this session, and I think we have lunch now. I'm not sure if there's anything else. <laughs>